Hello everyone, I'm Karen Foley here at the Calabasas Library, Authors' Night. Our guest is Dr. Henry Oster with his book, The Kindness of a Hangman, about Dr. Oster's experiences during World War II and his imprisonment in the death camps, not work camps, death camps. Ghetto and death camps. One of the few who was in the ghetto and four different concentration camps. But tell us first the meaning of the title, The Kindness of the Hangman. I have a co-writer who, I'm an optometrist, and he was a patient. And one day he took a little extra time, and he said, I'm so sorry, can I ask you for lunch? I took off my jacket, he discovered my number. And he was simply shocked. And so he said, well, you have to write a book, even if I have to do it. He has never written a book. Once we had gotten into it for about seven years, he said, what are we going to use for a title? He said, looking over the tapes and the interviews and all the writing, I noticed one thing. In four years, no one actually gave you one kindness of any sort. Then we thought about the incident that the executioner of the ghetto in Lodge, sort of uh, maybe because I looked like a mascot, would give me a slice of bread after each execution on Monday. It usually was done on Sundays. And he said, you know, that's the only kindness, that's the only title. And that got to be the title, The Kindness of a Hangman. That's why the noose on the cover is accompanied by a slice of bread, a life-sustaining extra portion to survive the conditions in the ghetto. Was the hangman a Nazi? No. Was he a German? These were two brothers, coincidentally, which always seemed to me, you could almost by our standard be professional football players, they were not skeletal, emaciated, they received extra food for the job of execution every Sunday. And it was just native-born people in Lodge. The ghetto was in Lodge. That's the second largest ghetto after Warsaw. One of fewer than 50 German-born boys found in all the camps after the war. I was born in the city of Cologne in Germany, and I was, to say the least, a rarity even among those in the camps and the ghettos, which were predominantly Hungarian, Polish, Czechoslovakian Jews. There were not many German Jewish children that survived. Uh, we rounded up as a family. Yes. And you were how old? I was just two weeks before my bar mitzvah. Uh, my, I was an only child, although I'm the only survivor of a family of 19, a customary story, but I had no siblings. And we were called, uh, rounded up is the proper word, and sent to Poland. What camp? That was the ghetto. The first the, one first was the ghetto, the ghetto in Lodge. How long were you in the ghetto? I was there three years. Three years? And, uh, what year was that? That was from 1941 to 1944. And it was, uh, like so many instances in my life, an unbelievable degree of luck to be at the right place at the right time that to this day I still do not understand. The right place? Not to be killed, yes. Yes. Still cannot comprehend that, uh, and I never will. My wife believes I have a guardian angel, and I think that's something to believe in, because coincident and timing, uh, the repeated um, selection, it's, everybody asks, you know, how do you explain that? There is no explanation. No way that I can explain it. Well, you were young, you were strong, you could work. Well, the concept of survival depended on your ability to work. When I was put into the ghetto, everybody had to work because the ghetto was hard to believe. Uh, in my way of thinking, designated to produce materials for the German military, 
requirements. It was only in 2011 when I would return to Germany for the first time after vowing I would never go back, that you say, oh no, you have the wrong idea. This was just like a holding A holding paddock. station, yes. For human beings, there were always about 160, because don't forget, all around there, all the major extermination camps were located. And if you had to do something, you had to work, usually 12 hours a day. And I worked in what they call the agriculture department, which really ironic because it was basically part of the city that was cordoned off called the ghetto. Like all ghettos in the world, starting off just simply segregating buildings from the rest of the population. And they happened to have a small field that I was asked with others to cultivate. When I was in Poland, someone said, well, the Jews wanted to be amongst themselves. That's why they went into the ghetto by choice. No. Well, that's a, in, I said that story. But it's clear. not an entirely unreasonable oh, I explanation for the. the an excuse of, to salvage their but guilt. But don't forget, Poland was as much, if not more, anti Semitic as Germany. Poland would never give the Jews any opportunity. They were all tradespeople, all with a hand, the tailors. And there was no opportunity for education, there was no way to have a career. They were mostly orthodox. And you find yourself more comfortable and safe congregating in small areas. In other countries where ghetto was first originated, was in Venice, of all places, it was by force. But you felt secure, more comfortable if you, shall we say, concentrated in the area. It's the same thing in Los Angeles. We have our... Uh, Barrio. Yes, we but have they can leave the barrio. They can take transportation That's and true. go away, and they can come back at will. Absolutely. You By residing, able? the residents, the neighborhoods, yeah. you have the Vietnamese, and you have the Chinese, Chinatown, you have the small, a little Tokyo. People congregate by choice, by choice where they difference. like to live. The rest of it is, of course, freedom, but not in the ghetto. But in Germany, they rounded you up? And the rest of the country, as well as in other Nazi-influenced countries, to keep track. Well, that's true. But the primary problem for myself and my family is that my family lived in Germany over 180 years. And you live just completely free and, and independent of anybody else. I did not have Jewish neighborhoods, not at all. They knew where you lived, and of course, when it came to send you out, you would be arrested overnight, always in darkness of night, and simply sent out. I never heard from him. No. I, uh, as I mentioned before, I had vowed after the liberation never to set foot on German soil. I went to France, the place in an orphanage, with the intention of going to Palestine, now Israel, on the very famous ship called the Exodus. But then in 1938, uh, miraculously, my mother's brother, my uncle, was able to leave Germany as one of the very few to leave that late, came to Los Angeles, and they found my name in the newspaper. The whole idea of uh, coming here was by the rare ability to leave Germany as late as 1938. But you had absolutely very little chance any other way, so we were stuck in Germany. Now, when your family was incarcerated after the ghetto, did you go as a family to a particular camp, or were you split up? My father perished of starvation in the ghetto. My mother uh, survived by making iron plates that went under the boots of German uh, armies. I, as I said, was working in the agriculture department, ability to steal food and help my mother and me to survive. And then in 1944, we were again trapped and sent to Auschwitz. You went, that was your first incarceration as in Auschwitz? 
well, the ghetto was... The ghetto, I mean, the, after the, the ghetto. Well, a, the actual concentration camp, the arrival, the name of the arrival facility was Birkenau. That was the reception committee where people were separated and sorted out for to die or to live. I was then housed there for several weeks by a, again, one of those incredible sheer timing of fate was it formed that they were looking for juvenile under 15 to 17 years of age. There were not even 200 in the whole camp of Birkenau. Stupidly enough at the time, but ingeniously as it happened, I not only ran for the selection, but raised my hand and say, I speak German, I speak German. And I was taken with 131 other boys of similar age to be put to work raising horses. Is it true that most of the people in the camps did not speak German? I was a pariah <laughs> among my own because. friends. And I had to learn Yiddish as quickly as possible, which German Jews don't speak Yiddish, in order to, quote, assimilate myself, linguistically at least, to be at least accepted somewhat. I always had a nickname called Yekka, which is a derogatory Yiddish word for Jews. And those 131 boys were actually then sent to the actual concentration camp of Auschwitz, which was a facility not for killing, but also not for survival, approximately two miles away. So it was from the ghetto, Birkenau, Auschwitz, and then later on a, a satellite camp, followed by a trip to Buchenwald, and I was back in Germany, just what I needed. We will come back to you in just a moment after we take a break. Stay with us, please. Karen Foley, Author's Night, and our guest author, Dr. Henry Oster, and his book, The Kindness of the Hangman. Before the break, we were in Auschwitz, and you were taken from Auschwitz Ooh. to Buchenwald. Mm -hmm. Why were you taken from Auschwitz? Well, when we were transferred and sort of given a tattoo in Birkenau, we were put on trucks and then go to the facility Auschwitz, which was a separate. Oh. We worked with horses because the Germans needed horses because they didn't have enough capability in the invasion of Russia mechanically, so they needed horses. So 131 worked there for about eight months. And your mother? My mother perished in Auschwitz oh. on arrival. The, uh, when we were taken off the train, men and women were separated, had to march down to the end of a, plat a railroad platform. My mother disappeared in the throng of women and ended up being gassed and cremated the day she arrived. 
I was selected to who knows what, stayed in Birkenau, given the number, and then again transferred to Auschwitz, where we worked. Auschwitz was being liberated in 1945 by the Russian army, and the Germans decided to empty Auschwitz-Birkenau by leaving, hopefully, no evidence. They destroyed the crematorium and put human beings on what's called a death march, which is a simple way to transport people on foot. You march in a column. The roads were littered with those that couldn't keep up. And the way that a death march works is threaten and act out. If you are separated from the column by a certain distance, you'll simply be executed and people just couldn't make it. You march very quickly if you have the strength and you don't actually hesitate for any moment because that would be a sign of weakness and would be followed by execution. From there we were put on the train, densely packed, an open livestock car. The train proceeded to leave Auschwitz. We were unfortunately misidentified, or what we now call friendly fire, and we were attacked by two Allied fighter planes. That attack caused much human loss in the wagon. I was lucky enough not to be in the trajectory, but I had enough time to look at the plane's insignia, and I was only familiar with Germans, and these had Allied insignias. Believe it or not, from 1941 to 1945, I had no idea that Europe had been invaded. We had no idea what was going on, and we certainly had no idea that there were Allied troops approaching the camp. The train took off the destination back into Germany. The attack took place because to the fighter pilot, the open vehicle, the open cars, showing all these people with a uniform, even though they're blue and white stripes, they assumed we were Germans. The train rode for several days, and we arrived in a place where we were unloaded, uncomfortably, almost impossibly, and we were greeted, welcome to Buchenwald. And that's how I know it. I was back in Germany. I stayed there till April 1945, when on the 1st of April, we sensed a strange calm, if you could say. And this background noise was missing. We couldn't explain it. The one thing we were all aware of, we didn't receive any food which was minimal anyway, a slice of bread and a cup or bowl of non-nutritional soup. We did not receive food for 10 days. On the 11th of April, 3 o'clock on a Friday, we heard again a very strange noise, which happened to be the tanks of Patton's Third Army. The camp was on a mountain right next to the prior to Berlin, capital of Weimar. And he sent the tanks up, having been made aware that there is a concentration camp. And we were liberated by the American Third Army, which, when we looked at the infantry, was a bit of a shock as well, because they were black. And I had never seen a black person before. Germany has never had it. It was unusual because the armies in that time in World War II were segregated. And it was even more peculiar, all this I found out long afterwards, that General Patton said, I don't care what people look like as long as they can kill Germans. And we were liberated by tanks and black infantry. To this day, those people still did not get full credit for what they did. I actually testified for certain authors that that was the fact, 
and that we are negligent in making that acknowledgement. As a matter of fact, I even wrote to the Secretary of the Army, the Army Chief of Staff, the Office of Public Affairs, whether or not they will in any way recognize and perhaps honor Patton's family, who has a granddaughter, on April the 11th of this year. The answer is nothing. No wonder people are so cynical about history books. Uh, history books, all the, as always, one important thing. History books are usually written by the victors. That's the and that expression is always I remember a well. slanted point of view. We Did don't you? admit what we should well, have done differently. And you're going back for the liberation? Yes. It's a 70th? Every five years. The, the I, first time I went back to Germany when I was discovered to exist, I was told by the city of Cologne that I am with a lady in Palo Alto, who unfortunately just passed away, are the only two survivors of 2011 people from the city of Cologne. Having sworn never to set foot on German soil, I consulted <laughs> with my family. And the decision was that it's going to be up to me how I feel. And uh, I decided to go. And when people say, why did you decide to go? I had said I only have one reason, and it was an obscene gesture with my middle finger. Oh. That's why I wanted to, I had to have my say and see what would happen. The main reason I was motivated was that in Germany, the major cities have a brass plaque in front of every residence. The stumbling stone. The stumbling stone. And as far as I was concerned, it is as close to uh, a gravesite. As my... you'll ever see. And it was, that was emotional. I, I went to the old address and I saw that. And uh, I guess that was enough reason for me to go. The other niceties, the city did uh, ask me, the mayor and the civic leaders greeted us. And I was allowed to reply. I mentioned, and it's at the end of my book, that I didn't come for revenge. I don't come with hatred. I came to honor my parents, six million Jews, one and a half of which were children, and for that matter, all the other victims of World War II. And I also mentioned to them that uh, I don't hold uh, a grudge or hatred, but I didn't come here for vacation. I didn't want to find out what the city had done to rebuild itself. But I'm here to remind you that you are the children or the grandchildren of the perpetrators of World War II. And while you are not responsible, we won't forget, we can't forget, and most important, whatever you do, wherever you go, everybody will see you as a German accompanied by a shadow of guilt. And that was what I felt I needed to say. It was actually quite well received. But uh, every five years, they have a reunion in the concentration camps with fewer and fewer survivors. I inquired how many reservations have they had so far, responses. They said, well, we have everybody in all that you will meet there, and we reserve that one hotel for all the survivors that are returning. So I Googled the hotel. It only has 90 rooms. So in one more reason, basically, to point out that the intent to kill 2,011 people from one city, hello, it still hasn't worked completely. My first contact with concentration camps, speaking of 70th anniversary, was on the day or the day after one of the camps, maybe Buchenwald, you said that had the most children, perhaps even yes. Auschwitz, was liberated. 
And uh, they did a radio broadcast from the camp. Buchenwald. And I remember walking into my bedroom as a very young child. Very young. My memory started about two and a half years old due to an accident. So I had a very keen memory, very young. And they were liberating the children. And they would ask the children, in the, uh, either German or Polish, I don't remember, because I was so young. There were only four that spoke German. They were German asking, what, what do you think? How do you feel? And all they asked back, where's my mother? Where's my father? Parents. Where's my family? Where am I? Who am I? Now, the search for parents was. I was the transfixed. One. I don't even remember leaving the room. I don't remember the end of the broadcast. And when I read that it was the 70th anniversary, I wondered where are these people I heard on the radio? Are they still alive? Did they live long enough to have a decent life? Well, and you did. Many did. Uh, did. Israel was, of course, at that time, Palestine took in a lot of them. But, uh, but their own countries turned them away afterwards. Oh, right. The Germans were not the only ones. Oh, with no, the, the Hungarians, the Polish. The that, Polish had persecutions again after the war. Yes, the had, they had to go back into ghetto like conditions to be saved from. The country they fled the first time. We can never back, welcome back. No. no. Not in uh, most of the countries. Uh, there's always been a subliminal underground anti-Semitism, which would show its, its, its face and end up into action. And you don't really feel terribly safe as a Jew in any European countries, to various degrees. Take a look at France. Do you today? Would you feel safe today? I would be very, un very uncomfortable. But Holland was a refuge for Jews in Germany, and now they're anti-Semitic with a with. Are they anti-Semitic, or do they all live in fear of a growing hostile population around them? That's what makes it happen. Yes. I'd like to come back in a few minutes. I still have a few questions sure. to ask, Dr. Oster. So please stay with me for one more quick intermission, and we'll be back soon to Author's Night. All right. I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. OK. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. It's Karen Foley, Author's Night here at the Calabasas Library. The book, The Kindness of the Hangman, and our honored guest, Dr. Henry Oster. Uh, the two questions I have, and we'll go on from there for a little bit. Number one, in the uh, recent New Yorker magazine, they were letters from Berlin. The last trial where they mentioned that they're still, still prosecuting. Yes. They're still finding people who are declared guilty of crimes against humanity and of their complicity in the camps, and they're executing them? 101 in When do they stop? I mean, down what line is being 
questioned. Hopefully to the very bottom. Not only the commandant of the camp, his lieutenants, his capos. They have been taken care even of Even the man who was a clerical helper. Are they all as guilty? Do they all deserve a sentence? Is that something you have ever pondered? I guess the answer to that is by longevity, to find uh, some of the younger Germans, especially, they consider to be elitists. They were in what, what you oh. call the Waffen SS, they were in the 20s and all that. They are still around, most likely. But most of them are in the 80s and older, but not less guilty. They had a lot of help from different countries, Catholic Church, mm. Argentina. Everybody. Everybody. Let's, and everybody. as a result of that, they, they were basically infused into society, changed names, personalities, and all that identities. And then when we recognized the subterfuge they had in our own country, we brought in Nazis for intelligence agents, the uh, space program, many different things. So it was not so difficult to hide in Germany. Simon Wiesenthal was, of course, the most famous pursuer and hunter of Nazis. Now that had obviously been taken over in the 70s by the Simon Wiesenthal Center here in Los Angeles, and of course New York, Jerusalem, and they are still very active and are basically to be credited with ferreting out the 101 that were prosecuted and sentenced in 2014. But that will still go on, there's still plenty of them around. Many of them were, of course, not necessarily military. They were not necessarily executioners. The ones, on the higher ones, the commandants, and like Eichmann, that was easy to prove. But the little guys, the ones that really tried to show the heroic loyalty to the Nazis, the actual shooters and executors, who were, by the way, always saying, we were ordered to do that. But interestingly enough, there were ways to object, and it started with the physicians who gave lethal injections to inmates and in the hospitals with the feeble-minded when Germany was using the American invented concept of eugenics. They would not go on and continually give the injections. So the Germans say there must be a better way to eradicate them more efficiently, quicker, and that's when they develop first automobiles or trucks connecting the exhaust to the inside to make mobile gas chambers. That wasn't very practical. Then they went with a barn, too difficult to seal. And that was still in Germany before World War II started. But once they had foreign soil in Poland with three million Jews, versus 600,000 in Germany and 400 some odd thousand in other countries, they built and erected the gas chambers and crematorium. And very efficiently through the uh, IBM machinery. Yes. Uh, many other companies. Many American companies, while they didn't participate actively, but their foreign divisions, including, not so surprisingly, Ford Motor Company. Because uh, Henry Ford was a viral rural Very anti Semite, yes. And they supplied. Lindbergh? Oh, Lindbergh was, uh, yes. But there are always connections that some people really don't want to acknowledge. and. You never know where support comes from. Business is business. And um, the participation of Ford by the manufacture of Opel and a lot of vehicles and a lot of tanks, 
even though they didn't profit from them. They couldn't get the money out. But these things exist, unfortunately, all over the world. Business interests are sometimes more important than human being interests. Money talks. Money does talk, yes. It's just, uh, I guess, part of history. Your previous guest had mentioned that every country, every people, seem to have the ability to become what he mentioned the Japanese were and the Germans. And I always said maybe it's part of human beings, DNA, or a country, I think, every country has the seat of hatred, bigotry, that can express itself in something like the Holocaust. And it's our job and responsibility as democratic and proper citizens not to fertilize these seeds, and you know what fertilizer we would use in conditions like that. It's unfortunate we have to live with that. I don't think uh, genocide is exclusive to Germans. We are guilty of the genocide of American natives. We brought people from foreign countries by force and made them slaves. We had scares of the McCarthy era by just simply a slogan or something. People signed loyalty oath, which didn't mean anything. If you're, not, uh, if you're an enemy of the country, what's a signature don't mean? We have uh, rather what I thought of well-intended, committed many, many human lives to wars, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, that this is not a criminal intent, but it is supporting regimes that never, ever, ever will be democratic. It's greed, avarice, power hungry. It's Man's a multiple DNA thing. to bully, to rule, to command. Yes. And unfortunately, power and force is respected by way of fear that people have. And the more powerful ones will win. I just, attend, I just had a controversy with the German consulate where a speech had been made by the vice consulate that I found was demeaning and offensive. And uh, I requested and received a uh, interview. And all they did was tell me what they were told in 1985 when they claimed the Allied liberated Germany. And they said, you've got to be kidding. Liberated you from what? Well, that's what our foreign minister says. And I said, well, Mr. Consul General and Vice Consul, I'm very surprised to hear diplomacy by being parrots. Well, that wasn't too well received. Right. And a few other things. Like the one parrot diplomacy. <laughs> I recall you said, by good fortune, you don't know you were the right place at the right time. And we know you're here now and a very successful, retired For one gentleman. year. For one year. <laughs> and the story of your journey to the United States is here in the book, yes. which is be here in the library for our readers and yeah. our viewers to that check. That was something. To see and to read the story. Well, it's obviously, I'm very proud to That's why I don't want to discuss. I want them to come and read the book because there's so much value in every word and every page. My and, family and everybody for years said, you know, it has to be a legacy. I think, I don't think I have more than a chapter in my life worthwhile. But Mr. Ford said, no, you got to be kidding because it isn't just a book uh, about how sad and bad it is. You have an optimism. That's what uh, the reader hopefully will Or a regain. will, a will. A will and opportunity. Uh, he always thought, you know, you worked all your life, even in your practice. You retired for one week and found it unacceptable. 
He worked 10 years at Kaiser Permanente and he retired just last year. Uh, my wife, <laughs> responsible. And then, by coincidence, the book ended up, after all these years, being ready uh, for this year. And uh, it's a tropicious moment to remind the world 70 and 75 years later, after the beginning of World War II, there's always hope that uh, hope sustained you, and not hatred, but I definitely I think wonder, it was defiance. But you mentioned something early on in our interview that you never had your bar mitzvah. I did did your faith sustain you, and have you ever had a bar mitzvah? No. You never wanted to? I don't know if it would be a positive thing in, in your kind interview. When you live in a camp and you see death around you and killing and the meaning, the, the non-meaning of human life, it turned out that the religious placed their faith and hope in something other than themselves, and I lost my faith. You were not in a position to sit there and pray and expect somebody to pick you out and rescue. You had to do it on your own. And what can you expect from a 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year old? You had to fend for yourself. When I was asked only last week by a rabbi, it's never too late, I could not bring myself to become bar mitzvah, which is, as far as I'm concerned, a ritual important when you are living a normal, free life. But under my conditions, I don't think it would add much. He said, well, it's, don't forget, it's in your head that you were. And I said, that may be true, but it has to come. I find it very understandable. But a person of yourself not to hold, like you said, grudges, not to want revenge, not no. to want to pay back. Amazing. No. But you have to understand, I feel that you've had the last word. I took down some notes when I was reading your book. I don't think there will ever be the appropriate justice for the Holocaust or the reckoning of its enormity no. or even acknowledgement by the whole world. But what you have done by writing your book is you are bearing witness that was to what intent. happened and of how it happened and therefore a place in history and as it has been said, not by me, but by someone far more clever, far more prescient, that all writing is revenge. And in that, you have yours. And thank you so much for giving us the honor of meeting you, of reading your book, and having the privilege of you as our guest. And I thank, thank you, you for our your audience. Opinion. My pleasure. Thank you, sir.